Namaste. Well, if there's one thing you need to know before we get into all these deep transcendental arguments on the nature of causality, it is the quadrilemma of causality. Now, you're probably saying, what the is a quadrilemma? Well, we first ran into that years ago when studying the Buddha's teaching. And the quadrilemma is basically the four possible logic values that a given term may have. It can be true. It could be false. It could be true and false, or it could be neither true nor false. And the Buddha provides plenty of examples of this. I don't have to go into that again. Uh, but even in the case of simplifying it to only true and false, there's a quadrilemma around the cause and effect. And we're going to go into that first and then build on that to understand the logic. So if there are two terms, a subject and a predicate, and in this case, that's cause and effect, we're also going to show examples. First of all, they can be both existent or true. And the example is the Abrahamic religions, Western religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Then the cause could be existent, but the effect can be non-existent. And the good example of that is Sankhya Yoga and the Vedas in general, especially Vedanta. In fact, Shankaracharya is famous for saying, Brahma Satyam, Jagan Mitya. Brahman is real. Diversity is false. And the Jiva is one with Brahman. The third possibility is that the cause is non-existent or false, and the effect is existent or true. An example of this would be the Phaishashikas, the atomists, and of course, modern science, which is based on it. And finally, both cause and effect can be non-existent. And a good example of that is Southern Buddhism. I mean, actually, within Buddhism, there are so many flavors of understanding. They probably hit on all of these. But for the sake of simplicity, we'll take them all as voidists. So these are the four basic possibilities when dealing with cause and effect. And actually, in general, they apply to any subject and predicate, any subject and object. Uh, so by generalizing, we get the advantage of being able to model all the possibilities of the whole truth space, that logic space, that space of reasoning about causality that either one or the other of the cause and the effect could be true, false, true and false, or neither true nor false. But I simplified it just to the first two. Otherwise, we'd have 16 possibilities and it would be a big mess. So you understand, I'm trying to get at the principle. Now, the other logical principle that we have to master to understand the arguments in this chapter which are very powerful and which lead to exalted realizations of the nature of reality is the method of agreement and difference. Now, this is a classical logical method. You've probably used it in your own life intuitively, but when it's formalized, it makes a lot more sense. Say, for example, I go out to dinner with some friends. Afterwards, we all get sick. So we analyze, what did we eat? John only ate the salad. Dave ate the soup and the drink. Henry only had the drink. Joe didn't eat anything. But they all had the sandwich. So 
by the principle of agreement, that says the sandwich is the cause of them getting sick. Now let's look at difference. Let's say the same people go out to eat, and only three of them get sick. Dave doesn't get sick. Now if we analyze what they ate, we find that only Dave did not take the sandwich, and he's the only one that did not get sick. That's difference. The proof of difference means that the absence of a factor creates the causality. The method of agreement means the concurrence of several factors determines the causality. So the first three chapters of Mandukya Upanishad use the method of agreement by scripture, by logic, and by practice, by experience, one can realize Brahma. The result is the same in all three cases. That means that Brahman is true. But in the fourth chapter, the difference method is used. We see that there are these different philosophies with different ways of understanding cause and effect. But of them all, only Advaita leads to self-realization, realization of Brahman. So in this way, we can understand that this Advaita is something special. And the reason it's so special, the most powerful technique, the most powerful knowledge that it has, you know, beyond aham brahmasmi, tattvamasi, uh, is that it exposes the myth of causality. Like we talked about in the last video, that causality is just a story. And it's a story we invent after the fact to make us feel like we understand what's going on, uh, even if we don't. <laughs> but at least in words, we can make it sound that way. Now, how is it that we use words, specifically name and form, to create the illusion of causality and also the illusion that we know what's going on? Let's take a look at that. We like to control causality so that we can get the things that we want. Humans enforce the myth of causality by stories. These stories restrict the factors and the possible outcomes of any change. We do that by creating laboratory conditions, restricting the environment, leading to the creation of causal chains, stories like chemical reactions or like a manufacturing process or like any kind of a story that takes us through a bunch of changes. This is the basis of science, technology, and engineering. By creating conditions and standardizing the environments, the leaders of society like to standardize the environmental factors like language and schedule. You know, everybody gets up early in the morning, goes to work like that, so that the society is manageable. Otherwise, it would be too chaotic. This increases efficiency but it inhibits originality, individualism. And eventually these stories break down when conditions change. And conditions always change. Huh? Nothing remains the same for too long. Sometimes we do stuff that changes it, sometimes nature, sometimes God. This is called adiatmic, adidaivic, and adibhotic. And change always leads to suffering because our poor linear brains can only plan in a straight line and assume that the current conditions are going to continue. Because after all, well, they have continued for a while now, haven't they? Yeah, but they always change. When they change, not if, but when, and it's impossible for us to predict, then all our plans go out the window. All our carefully constructed causal chains stop working. When that kind of a magnitude of a change happens, 
it throws the whole society into chaos because now nobody knows which causal chains are going to work and what their outcomes are going to be. So human society tries to narrow down the environmental influences. And this is how we build these devices, like these wonderful cameras and video and stuff like this, the internet and so on. It all depends on a long chain of cause and effect going back through the supply chain to, you know, mines, digging stuff out of the earth. And, of course, then people designing things and stuff like that. And it goes into the future as well, because we assume these conditions are going to continue. But when they don't, everything breaks down. And we lose the plot. We don't understand anymore the cause of what's happening or how to manipulate that cause to get what we want. So this is why the study of causal logic is so important. And then when we reach the point where we transcend it, and we realize that, oh, wait a minute, this is just a story. This is just a myth that we create to make ourselves feel comfortable living in this inconceivable, unpredictable world. Then it becomes obvious that the only thing that separates us from Brahman is name and form. In other words, Maya. Huh? What makes the snake appear on the rope? What makes the appearance of a lake in the desert or an island in the ocean when there's actually nothing there? Huh? This is Maya illusion. It's dreaming while awake is actually what it is. And it's based on memories and the suggestions from the surrounding environment and so on. But basically, it's an overlapping or superimposition of two different states of consciousness. Jagrat, waking consciousness, and Svapna, dreaming consciousness. So these are the causes of our experience. And once we unravel these causes and see through them to the actuality, we realize that most of what we experience is simply Maya. Now the next episodes are going to discuss this in detail. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Oh, Namah Shivaya. <laughs> you know, it's, this world, it's sometimes like Shakti went to Shiva in the early days of the universe and said, well, what kind of universe are we going to create now, hon? <laughs> and he says, well, lovey, I don't know, surprise me. <laughs>